Good afternoon, folks. How's everybody holding up? Good, good. good. We're in our fourth of uh, five sessions today, so welcome to this next session. Um, I'm Scott Kelly, uh, account executive from Cloudera, and again, we're the uh, you know modern platform for machine learning and analytics in the cloud and in your own data center. So. Um, we uh, have a great presentation upcoming with um, Howison Schroeder, and uh, he's going to give us an overview from uh, neurokinetics. So, welcome. Thank you very much. Let's see uh, if it's cold. It's not cold. <clears throat> so, there are a lot of different diseases. Um, that we probably have to worry about. There are a million multiple sclerosis folks in the US, a million Parkinson's, 30 million diabetes, 7.2 million diabetic retinopathy, 2.8 million concussions that show up in the emergency department in the US. That day is actually a couple years old. And they estimate up to 7.5 million uh, sports concussions in the US. So let's think of our eyes now, we talk about as a window to the soul, let's think of it now as a portal into the brain. And if our brain's our CPU, it's processing virtually everything in the body. So we can use technology, what we call eye portal technology, it's eye tracking. Um, pretty common stuff eye tracking, but there's a difference between clinical eye tracking and all other eye tracking, which we kind of maybe disingenuously refer to as gaze tracking. But you, the, anyway, there are 200, over 200 different diseases that show up in the form of an abnormal eye movement. If we can use some technology to then take that, those abnormal eye movements, which are now overlaid with a test, filter that data like a prism, and we can begin to figure out what people might have with a vestibular problem, concussions, which we're working on now, diabetic retinopathy, MS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, a whole plethora of different diseases that we can look at as we get smart about this. Key is you got to be really precise in how you track and measure the eyes. Because the brain is basically signaling us through the eyes. And if you're accurate and precise about how you measure the eyes, we're basically measuring the neural functional response, the neural biosignals of the brain through the eyes. So we right now use it ostensibly as a measurement tool. And we're focused right now because the huge immediate unmet need are concussions. We said seven and a half million sports. There are one in five high school kids that they say have concussions now. 15% of all sports injuries are concussions and growing. Another name for concussion is mild traumatic brain injury. So we often use TBI for short and MTBI for concussions. There is no objective tool cleared by the FDA, accepted by the medical um, field right now, to evaluate, measure, report on a concussion. It's a subjective diagnosis evaluation. So how do you measure something as subtle as a mild traumatic brain injury? And I say mild in contrast to moderate and severe. That means you've got fluid on the brain. That you can see in a CT scan. <clears throat> but these sports concussions don't show up in a CT scan. Again, you got to have sensitive, precise technology to measure the eyes. <clears throat> and if we think about concussions, OK, it's still pretty massive headlines. It just hasn't gone away. For years now, we've been trying to solve this problem, and I haven't. Um, <clears throat> we were lucky enough um, earlier this year to be added to IndyCar's concussion evaluation protocol. Um, that's Dr. Terry Trammell and me. You can't tell that's me. I, I, this was in the USA Today, but didn't give me my name. So if that's Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame, what's that like a, is that like a 0.5 second of fame if your picture's there but no name? With your face covered up. That's right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, anyway, um, that's probably the most epiphanal change in concussion evaluation protocols in the last 15 to 20 years, particularly in professional sports. Uh, we're on the verge of another transaction with another major sports entity um, hopefully, knock wood, by the end of this month, we'll have something to share. Anyway, if we're using the signal processing and what we refer to as our eye portal overt or oculomotor vestibular reaction time test battery, and, and these are the things you do over there, you begin to reveal all these different deficits that get us to these different diseases. 
we took a, um, in the literature, there's a fair bit. So on the, on the far um, left are the tests that we can run. And on the top are the different parts of the brain that get used to run each one of those tests. So again, if you do a comprehensive test battery here, we basically can figure out how well the brain is working or isn't working, where it's working or where it isn't working. This is a, a bit's a busy slide, but basic gist is we do a whole bunch of tests. And depending upon the platform, different tests in different ways, but a fair bit of overlap. One more, come on. These are our platforms. Um, the, our friends at the Department of Defense refer to that device in the middle as the big ass chair. Um, we've been doing that for a very long time. We actually started back in the mid 70s as a division of Contrava Skirts. Um, just recently, um, the day before Thanksgiving last year, so gosh, almost a year ago, we released the device on the right, which we refer to as iPass, which stands for iPortal Portable Assessment System. If you're going to run 12 tests in that iPass, maybe it takes about six, uh, six seven minutes. Um, we actually are we're running 12 tests at uh, West Point right now. They're now baselining all their cadets with that device. Um, and we're collecting uh, at 100 frames per second up to 250 frames per second. Uh, 100 million test sessions, we could be looking at some very big data sets. And frankly, this is not where our expertise is, is figuring out how to mine those data sets. But in what we have been able to do in mining these data, well, here's an example of one of the tests. So this is called an optokinetic test. This goes past you, and actually I have a sample. If anybody wants to be tested later, I'm happy to give you a test um, sitting over in the corner over there. So we give you this little disco ball going round and round, left and right, and if you're normal, you look like that person on the left. Makes you look kind of dizzy, but you actually, this is what you do when you're normal. If you've been concussed, you can look like the person on the right. Now what's important is this is just one test. You have to do multiple tests if you're gonna actually look at what the brain is doing. Here are some of our data sets. So on that same test I just showed you, here's some of the data we collect. This gets dumped into a database. Another test, you know, the smooth pursuit test, your primary care physician, when they do this, we do that as well. But we know exactly where that finger is in time and space. We know exactly where your eye is at each one one hundredth of a second relative to where that finger or dot is. And if you do that, it's fascinating what you can see. Um, if you look up here, that's where your eye jumps. It's supposed to actually follow a smooth path. That tells us how much of your eye jumped. That's not a good thing. I just tested a whole um, National Hockey League team the other week, and they're really talented. I mean, they had almost none of these jumpy inclusions in their eye. They can't. If the puck's coming down the ice, they gotta be able to follow it smoothly. If their eye's bouncing around, they're never gonna get their stick on that puck. If any of you are statistical geeks, something called area under the curve, our data with some pretty good studies uh, 0 0.96, 0 0.95. If you're geeky enough to know that, that's pretty damn good data. If you're not geeky enough to know that, another way to look at the data, we had 300 controls, 106 concussions, all acute, about two and a half days. That's pretty exceptional separation there. You gotta have fine-tuned, sensitive data, and nobody's come up with data like that yet, except us. What we had to do with that, we did 16 tests. And out of those 16 tests, when we ran our simple logistical regressions, it'd be interesting to see what machine learning tells us. These candy stripes up here, those are the five tests and six variables that make up what we refer to as our concussion score. And if we mine it, we probably can do an even better job or we expand some of those tests. The other thing we can do is we can look and see how people heal over time. This is a neurofunctional assessment. If you're healing, your brain's gonna start to perform normally again. So here are 50 people that we tested three times. This is their first test session, about two and a half days after they got their head bonked, and diagnosed by a doctor in the emergency department, Madigan Army Hospital and San Diego Naval Hospitals. On the third session, roughly 16 days, you can see who got worse, who got better, and who actually healed. 
this return to play, return to learn, pretty damn powerful information. So we've got highly sensitive, objective neurofunctional data, and it's a whole new data set. Uh, I was talking to somebody at lunch. We all know about EEG. All the neurologists will do an EEG on your brain. If you go to the American Academy of Neurology, there are two full day sessions teaching you how to read EEGs. There is barely a half day session on how to read this kind of data mixed in with a dozen other tests. This is not part of the data set yet. So as we think about how we're gonna actually pursue this, we gotta figure out how to set up some bank of data that we can go begin to mine. We're collecting data in concussions right now. What about MS? What does Parkinson's look like? What does aut aut um, autism, Alzheimer's, schizophrenia? All these have abnormal eye movements. We're pretty convinced that they will all have a pretty discrete profile if we have enough data to actually map, map each one of their profiles. Got to have a consistent data set. We're trying to figure out how to do a better job in that. What's the data mean? And how should we be using it? One of our other questions. We're pretty focused on, we've got a device, we got a market, let's go sell it now. Worry about that data later. But there's a huge opportunity here. Frankly, we're not wired yet to figure out how to tap into it. Anyway, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, any questions? So does everyone kind of need a baseline before you can tell? Or? A baseline really helps, but you don't need a baseline. If you go back actually here, so this guy, um, this is a normal data set. So you don't really need a baseline as long as we profiled your population. I will add, this is also a relational scale. So this is probably the special forces and better athletes. And, and actually, we see that when we test pro athletes relative to the population at large. This person's really hurting. If I have a baseline, so we actually um, we did a study for IndyCar. We baselined all their um, drivers, and we compared their data to um, 42 IndyCar drivers to 100 and, uh, excuse me, 170 some odd high, uh, college athletes at the University of Miami. A um, couple things are dramatically different. So by baselining, we now know that that optokinetic test I showed you with a disco ball going by, you want to be a gain of what we refer to as gain. Gain of one is perfect. So you're matching exactly how the dots are moving. Um, for normal, you might be 0.8. The IndyCar driver's normal is 0.4. So if they walked in off the street to a doctor, he'd say, you've got something wrong. But they don't. You know, they've learned at 240 miles an hour woof, woof, that if they can't suppress that, they're going to be dizzy and have a wreck. So in that sense, baselines do make a difference because different profiles of people in performance can. But the average human being, yeah, you don't need a baseline. Smart, because I would know then if you really are different than where you were before, but not necessary. Yeah? In terms of diagnostic value, what do you see happening with this technology? Well, because it's not part of the, it, it's not part of the educational data set right now, um, what's that first need, which is why concussions, and there's been money for concussions as well through the <coughs> Department of Defense. And, um, uh, Let's get that anchored first. And once this device is out there, it's just changing the algorithm. Um, the algorithm for um, MS, it's a software upgrade. So in theory, we'll have, once we have the concussion score, then we'll have the MS score, or the Parkinson score, or the diabetic retinopathy score. We've got a diabetic retinopathy diagnostic product sitting on the shelf right now. We just don't have the bandwidth to um, uh, follow up with the commercialization. I will say that we are FDA cleared. We're FDA cleared as we refer to it as a measurement tool. So any doctor can go collect that data and then interpret it. But there's a lot of data, and again, that puts more emphasis on the education part. The concussion score will be at basically pretty much a red-green binary, high probability your concussion or low probability. <clears throat> um, within that as well, if the brain's a muscle, this is also a therapeutic tool. Uh, right now, concussions are being sent to the primary, uh, uh, excuse me, the physical therapy clinics. 
And the physical therapists are going, what are we supposed to do? We have no power to diagnose or figure out what's going on, and we have no objective metrics to figure out what is going on. The data from here is highly objective, and if you flunk a, a smooth pursuit test, I can do exercises to make you better. And in theory, by doing that, I'm also rebuilding that neural pathway. Okay, thank you all very much.